sell this time of year, you know, it's uh, tis the season to start thinking about our lives, thinking about what we're doing, where we want to go with the next next year coming up. Um, leading up to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you know, the central question on everyone's mind is, you know, how, how can I make my life better? And I promise you this is not a class on tshuva. I'm not doing that to you. You guys are going to probably hear it enough. It looks like a lot different. Because generally people think about when they're, when they're trying to reassess their lives as well, they start thinking, well, you know, what's my relationship with God like? Bein Adam Lomakom. And they think about how's the relationships with other people? Bein Adam Lomakom. And they kind of leave it at that. And that's pretty good. I mean, I'm not trying to, not trying to be down on, on uh, reorienting one's life to other people. But it's missing a big component. Bein Adam Lomakom how one relates to himself. What we're going to cover tonight is that central question, how, how to relate to ourselves, because that's actually, as it turns out, the primary job that we have in this life is regarding how we treat ourselves. It's the first step in, in how we relate to God, how we relate to other people. It really starts at home. It starts with ourselves. Revolba, who was a previous generation's uh, one of the one of the big guys. He was one of the big guns as far as rabbis go, and and he, he had a pretty unique way of looking at how one ought to look at their life. You know, he kind of he, the way he kind of frames it is, well, your neshama is kind of like the parent, and your goof, your your body, so to speak, is kind of like the child, and it's one big uh, one big parenting act all the way through life. How to take care of yourself? How to treat yourself with the the, the, the right way? And the, what, what's kind of happened, especially because you know, of our friends, the psychologists, you know, in the, in the 80s, early 90s, kind of flubbed things up a little bit. They got onto the self-esteem train, and that train does not lead to a good place. It seemed to be in research, there was a lot of really, really great correlation. You know, people who seemed to think well of themselves, do really well academically, and, and seemed to, you know, suffer less problems, uh, you know, less emotional problems. And so there was kind of like this knee-jerk reaction, well, oh, and if you guys, you know, you know if you like yourself, well, it must be that's, you know, high self-esteem might, it must be that's the, that's the causal factor. You know, well, in statistics, correlation is not prediction. It really turned out that self-esteem had nothing to do with why people were doing good in life. In fact, as we're going to kind of cover tonight, um, you don't want to have self-esteem. That's one thing you don't want. You want to have self-compassion, self-love. Accepting who you are and starting from there, as opposed to entering a rat race where you're good, you're fine, every, you know, that's, that's the standard we have to maintain. That's the party line, and any challenge to that, it's going to knock you down unfortunately. So we're going to get into that today. The first source I want to cover is Rabbi And again, I said, I'm not, I promise I'm not going to be talking Tshuva tonight. Rabbi is known for his famous safer, uh, Shari Tshuva. And he wrote another book called Shari Avoda, which outlined, you know, how, how do you serve God? How do you serve Hashem? And, and as I kind of set up already, you know, he said the first step is really knowing your own self-worth. <coughs> knowing who you are and what you're about. Knowing where you come from, that your ancestors had something to them, and not just Avram Ravino and everybody else who, yeah, of course, they're amazing, but, you know, your parents and your grandparents and everybody in your, in your family, you know, they, they, so they biologically built you to this point in time. And you carry that with you in your genes. I and mean, it's kind of a cool thing how, you know, as we go through life, it's almost like with each challenge you have in life, it's almost like within your genes, the genes actually recorded, so to speak, the memory that your, your ancestors had. So when you hit problems in life, you know, it's, you know, you know obviously you don't, you don't like magically have memories, you know, five generations ago, your, your great-great-grandfather, but his actual experiences, his actual, the memories that he had in his body actually are contained in your genetic code, and you actually open those suckers up when you actually face the problem, trying to solve that problem, when you're pushed to the limits of who you are now and have to grow, that's, that's, really, that's really what brings out your greatness, everyone who lived before you. So that's, that's something big, that's something to be proud of. And he, he ends off with the last thing that, that Hashem thinks that you're chavi, that Hashem actually he thinks you're precious. That's the first step in Avodah Hashem, knowing those, those three points. Rabbi Tzadok, probably in the 20th century, 
jump in a couple years from remaining young. He expands this a lot from not just knowing your own, your own value, but having a moon in it, in the same way that you have a moon in a shem. So what's a moon? What's faith? The way the, the question is kind of approached nowadays is more like, you know, we're trying to prove God exists. And that, that's not a moon. It's the start of it. It's, kind of like you, it's like you enter a mall, you know, you have that big that big old sign and you go in, it's like the you are here sign, the big red dot. I mean, that's it's a good, you know, you got to start somewhere, you know, that's a, that's a fair place to start, but that's not a moon. A moon is, is the sort of thing, you know, the, the, the realities in life that you know so well you never question. It's like gravity. You know, if, you know, you, you see you got your plates on uh, on your laps. You know, everyone is kind of is very much self aware that you got to be careful. You don't want this thing to fall, and and no one has to pull out. You know, Sir Isaac Newton's uh, you know uh, analysis of, of physics to be able to know, like, and prove it to themselves that such a thing as gravity exists. You just we, we intuitively know it. We live with that reality unquestionably because we experience it. That's a moon. Chazanish, I really love this. He like the. You guys ever read a little bit of Chazanish? They have a lot of his books in English. He has such a finesse in how he defines terms, and and I love in his in his Amuna Bitachlan Sefer. Um, he defines Amuna as this as this quality, as almost this innate natural quality all people have of being open and curious. That's how he defines Amuna, because the the, the only reason why you're open and curious is because you. You take on as a given, there must be something meaningful in front of you that you should be open and curious about. That's faith. And so on a basic level, you know, we, we have faith in our experiences, we have faith in our lives, and, and okay, so the work is kind of like expanding that one to having faith in God. But we're all we're all natural we're all naturally walking around with a lot of the moon of open and curious and wanting to know more. So it's having that level of of faith in yourself, that you're okay. I mentioned Revolva before. He's the third citation here. He gets pretty specific. He says that each one of us has, for lack of a better term, different personality <laughs> traits. And we do. You know, take a personality assessment. You know, they have the, the big five personality assessment. That's a great questionnaire you guys can take and figure out you know, what, what your proclivities are, and it's a fun thing to do. It's, it's the only uh, scientifically validated uh, personality questionnaire. And you can find it online, you know, it's, it's free, and, you know, get that one. And it, it, you're basically, like, the, the way he kind of describes it is, it's, it's so easy to know our failings. Survival tactic, honestly. You know, if we weren't if we weren't painfully aware of our failings, well, on a fundamental level, we'd be we'd be we'd be open to not surviving pretty quick. We take seriously fear. We take seriously failings because we don't want to feel those things. They're they're darn painful. It's easy to know where we where we fall and where we fail. So it's harder to know where you're great, and you have to get that one down specifically. What are your strengths? What are your interests? There are some people who are ju they're just an analytically inclined. Those people should become engineers, but they better know they should become engineers instead of fighting the rest of their lives trying to you know, get, you know, get a job as a writer or a poet. It's like, that's not your strength. Don't do, do yourself a favor. Don't do that. And there are some people the opposite. Start where you can win is the rule he basically puts down, but you've got to know how you can win. That's the third, the third angle on this. But isn't that self-esteem then? It'll be positive self-regard. That's for sure true. It's like you kind of think like, well, self-esteem is trying to make yourself feel, you know, to have positive self-regard. Well, self-compassion also is. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tease those out because you're 100 percent right. You know, where is that line? So what gets in the way of this? You know, my wife. She, uh, they, they have all over Yerushalayim, they have these things called, you know, Moservad. It's, it's basically, it's, 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 a, it's a, um, a personal growth group on steroids, basically. And, you know, the, 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 the Moservad that she's been on the past 10 years was actually designed by Revolva. 
And man, he was true to his word, you know. The, he describes like focusing years on realizing as this first step is remaining on outline. It takes years to know your strengths before you start moving on to being down on yourself where your failures are. So she had been in this Musravad for about 10 years. They just finally got to a, to a new character, the first negative character trait. You know, they were working on treating themselves with, with dignity and you know, working on, on a, you know, greater awareness and davening, but those aren't negative character traits. I mean, they get you far. So he just started working on blaming. The first negative character trait, 10 years. Takes a long time. So the, the first thing that gets in the way is just not being patient. It's like, yeah, 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 I know myself. Okay, fine, you know, like, no, not at all. You know, the, 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 the fundamental problem of any, you know, especially in my field, you know, people coming in with psychological problems, the fundamental problem is that people don't know themselves, don't take themselves seriously. They really don't know their strengths. You know, whether because of the way they grew up or the way people treat them. And the world can be pretty darned unfair. Got a lot against you being able to figure out your strengths. So the first thing is just lacking patience, wanting to get on with things. You know, well, isn't this about doing chuva? Isn't this about, you know, where I'm messing up? The Yates of Har would be very happy to take you there. You know, the more he can grind you in the ground, you know, the, this, 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 neg this negative internal inclination we have to, to be a down on ourselves. The Yates are hard. More than happy to take you there. So that's the first thing: the lack of patience. The second thing that gets in the way, says the Nefesh Shachayim, is it's not just this lack of patience, but it's you know the, the Yitzhahara, the way that we look at ourselves. You know, it's almost never enough. I, mean, I love the I love the way in, in, in Nefesh Shachayim the exact quote he puts here is Lo haya behem shum tov. That, yeah, whatever you're doing, yeah, it's not, it's not, it, it, it ain't good yet. So you're always, it's like almost like you know, in our lives, we're always holding out hope, well, maybe I'll get it ne next time, you know, man, you know, well, maybe one day I'll be okay. And, and we put a lot of effort into it, you know, no, no one's lazy. You know, that's, that's, the, that's almost the tragedy in my field, is like people come in and they think like, well, they haven't tried hard enough. And when you hear their stories, it's like, they put their heart and guts into trying to improve their lives. And that doesn't work, you know, it's usually a, it's usually a question of living differently, as opposed to trying harder. No one is lazy. Not a single person. I've never met a single person who's lazy. So it's this sort of, you know, rubbing your rubbing your face and having high standards. It's sort of like you know maladaptive perfectionism, really. Is comparing ourselves to other people. And again, back to your to your question of like that sort of difference of self-esteem is very much rooted in. in Self-esteem is mostly how you relate to others, oddly enough. It's like it's, it creates this hierarchy where I have to be good. And well, how do you know you're good? Well, you compare yourself to everybody else. And we, we often are much more kind to everyone else. You know, one of the, one of the chief strategies in therapy, you have someone come in, you know, and they're, they're suffering, beating themselves up. You ask them, well, what's, what advice would you give to a friend? Or you use the guided imagery to like make them think about you know their life and the way they were as a baby. And ask, well, you know, little kid, you know, well, how would you treat this little kid? Everyone always has the right answer. Everyone. The last source that kind of outlines, okay, you know, what what kind of gets in the way of developing this self-love, this self-compassion, is just our, our natural being. You know, a lot of the virtues and you know li living a living a moral virtuous life. These are these are the, first of all, it's not evident how you do that. I mean, like. You know, you look at halacha, there's, there's disputes in every halacha, so there's, you know, within the halachic system, you know, within the Jewish legal system, there's a battleground of what's right and what's not right. So it's not, you know, to begin with, it's not obvious. But, but more than that, you know, being virtuous is, a, is a, you know, values like that. They're not things you can actually grab and hold on to. They're not physical things. And just by virtue of the fact that we're people and we have bodies, we relate to the physical world just much more directly than we relate to ideas of kindness. You know, when was the last time you saw kindness? We saw a person act it out, but actually being able to, you know, well, define kindness, and that, that in of itself, you know, floors me. We, we end up usually knowing virtues before we can actually articulate them verbally. You, know, you remember when you, were, when you were a kid, and kind of a, an example of this sort of idea. It's like more like we discover virtue, we discover morality. It's because it really is deep buried inside of us. A little bit going back to Revolva with, again, trying to find what are your, your positive character traits? What are your strengths? They're built in us. But uh, an example of this is, you guys ever, you ever playing tag? You know, running around in the neighborhood and, 
and inevitably in every game attack, someone screams you're breaking the rules, right? There's always that one poor kid who just doesn't know how to play tag and everyone yells at him. Where's the rule book? Who wrote that? I never saw the rule book attack. But we all intuitively knew it. And that's, that's as, a, as an example, as a, as, a, as, a, as a metaphor, that's kind of like you know, discovering, discovering virtue, and discovering morality, discovering how to, how to, how to, how to have clear to yourself what does it mean that you're a good person. You actually know it in your body before you can actually describe it to yourself. It makes it easier to miss, not not having a clear definition of it. But you act it out. And that's why it's like a big tragedy. Is most people are actually acting really, really great, but because they don't have such a clear definition, because they're more more used to being physical bodies, let's say. You miss it. You just straight up miss that you're great. So I think that's a fair, fair, you know, rounding out of of the sources here. And what the first step of Vodas Hashem is. I know you guys are awesome. And what gets in the way? Before I press on, any 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 questions before I move forward or thoughts? Yeah. You said that if you have a plate on your laps, yeah. then you know that you should be careful. So it's it's the building block. It's the building blocks to knowing that there's God. So the the point with that is that we're innately curious and open. We innately want to find meaning. You guys want to do a little exercise? Kind of cute. Any any volunteers? Anyone brave? You're brave. Do you want to volunteer? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yeah? Can I do? Yeah. Okay. Pick three objects. Anything? Any three objects. That I can but they have to be right physical. Now? They have to be physical objects. Yeah, you bet. That I can. Any three objects. I'm saying like that Anything. Okay. Anything. Anywhere. <laughs> One can be Mars. It doesn't matter. A spoon. A spoon. A ball and an umbrella. Spoon, ball, and umbrella. Okay. Which one's harder? I don't know what ball you're talking about, but I know it's spoon. Okay. Um, which one's more useful? <laughs> Which one's older? <laughs> Which one's the father? <laughs> Watch what she did. The eyebrows went up. You took that seriously. <laughs> Everyone takes that question seriously. It's important. Which one's the father? It's like, none of them are the father. That's the, I mean, that's, that's the literal. No, no, no. You got the answer right. Because literally speaking, not, none of them are the father, but we don't live in a literal world. We are constantly searching for meaning. That's a question of meaning. And we just do it like that. That's, that's the trait of a Muna, the assumption there is meaning. So when it comes to God, it's kind of extending that, it's, it's extending that, that skill, you know, lack of a better term. It's extending that skill to more metaphysical, spiritual questions. But it's the same, it's the same behavior. That's a moon. Um, was, that, was that a fair answer to your question? Or did I just make it more complicated unnecessarily? <laughs> it's just the end, the end result of building up the moon. Okay. Like you just know that there's a place, so you know that there's a God. Yeah. I mean, it, honestly, it's like, well, like, it, kind of like this question. I mean, like, it, none of the fault. Like, why would why would you ever assume there is? But like, something in us just wants to assume. You know, we just want to do it. You know, we're itching. We're itching for you need an answer. But it's it, but even here, it's not like a math no. problem to be solved. Yeah? yeah. You know, it's more than just an answer. I guess is the point I'm making. It's an answer, you're right? But it's more than yeah. Bottom line, yeah, that's where it starts. That's the bottom line of what I'm talking about tonight. That's the bottom. Line. Questions have. So kind of taking all these sources and mixing them together, you know, what, what do we get out of the instruction here? Because this, what, I, what I'm presenting to you is a roadmap of, you know, what do you have to do to to to, to take this first step into Bodhisattva? 
is accurately knowing your own importance. I'm just going to read. I think I put this in the in the sheet, but this is this is the summation here. You know, the first step in serving Hashem is accurately knowing your own importance and innate greatness. This understanding must be to such an extent that it's your lived experience that we have a moon in ourselves, the same way that we do with Hashem, the same way, the same certain we have that gravity exists. Now, this knowledge is going to be specific in as far as what our natural strengths are. Now, this first step is going to be challenged by our Yitzhar Har in, in the ways that I outline. Yeah? If someone doesn't believe in God, or they don't find they believe in God, believing in themselves won't help because they'll just make them think more that I'm in charge of the world and it's all about me, when it's not, we're just kind of It's easy to do with self-esteem, it's harder to do with self-compassion. You're asking the questions. You keep wanting me just to, to, to schlep to the end. But that good question. But it is. You're, you're right, but that's a trap of self-esteem. Because with when again with, with self-esteem, it's 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 it really is artificially making yourself your own god. You know. This is kind of the way that you're so, I don't know if I'm putting words in your mouth, but it is kind of that. Ultimately, we're here to self so With, really, Yeah. It is about us, but it's not about us. The self compassion is more what's your place, what's your place in the world. So it's, it's actually, it's it, it almost, it's it's like a paradox. It almost has nothing to do with you, which means it has everything to do with you. And by kind of like broadening that scope, you know, when we immediately start asking the question, you know, well, where, what is my place with everybody else? I mean, you kind of get confronted with, well, like, well, kind of with the with the with the spoon game. It's like, well, why should there be any meaning? Be me these are the other people. It, it begs the question. Now, I'm not going to like this again. This is not a you know I'm proving God class. Like I'm not doing that. You know, it's at the very least you're you're feeling something more meaningful than you. It's the very least. All right. <clears throat> so what this ends up happening is you have to have three skills to be able to, to, to walk this road. The one is you have to be able to accurately discriminate your experiences. You have to be able to know who you are and who you aren't. Where you're good, what, what are your strengths, and, and then after you cover that first step and get to the second step, well, okay, well, where, 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 where in your life do you need to improve? You have to be able to discriminate. You have to be in the present moment mindfully not get trapped in the past and the worries that you're carrying with you and not get sucked into ruminating about the the future and what might be and what might not be and the fears that that live there it requires being mindful in the present moment who we are now and it's ultimately a, a life philosophy kind of getting back to your your question more you know again you know with this this sort of life path it's, it's, and it has to be a life philosophy it's just like that that uh, it's it is bigger than who we are so there's two solutions I and mean, we already kind of suggested them one is well how do you feel good about yourself self-esteem that's one solution that doesn't work and the other that i'm i'm definitely advocating fighting for is is self-compassion so what's the difference between these guys you know with self-esteem Man, I, I mean, the, the last count, there must be like 15,000 uh, uh, research papers on self-esteem. I mean, it's like one of the most well-researched uh, topics in psychology. And like I said, for good reason, you know, initially you know, researchers were saying, wow, like if people really like themselves, they just do a better job of life. Yeah, go for it. No, don't. I don't even want to say, yeah. like, A, the present moment, B, what you're giving your strengths, your weaknesses, yeah. and just be able to take that and continue on with your purpose. I, I take, yeah, I, I like that. No one ever defines self-esteem that way, unfortunately, within within the research. No, that would be more that, yeah, yeah, but that's okay. right direction, you know, like that, that's, that's, a, that's a fair, acceptance is a big one. And so the basic definition that, you know, in all these, you know, 15,000 know, uh, research papers that they gave is how self-esteem is the evaluation of a person's worthiness as an individual. It's a judgment that we're good, 
valuable people. That's self-esteem. So kind of the pitfalls that, that end up falling out from self-esteem, number one, is, well, people only generally have self-esteem in what they're good at. They kind of ignore everything else. So it's like, well, if you're, if you're really good at math, you're going to have a lot of really, you know, you're going to have a significant amount of self-esteem in math. You know, good job, you're a math guy. What ends up happening is that if that's what a person's chasing after, what ends up happening is, well, that's all they kind of spend their time in. So it's almost like a person inevitably develops this blind spot. They never actually feel it's worthwhile investing time in other things they're not good at. Well, because the goal is self-esteem, and if I feel good about math, I'm sticking with math. That's one outcome that, uh, that they're seeing now with self-esteem. Creates a blind, a blind spot. The other thing is, it, it, like I kind of said before, it really it sets up a zero-sum game, where either you're valuable or either you aren't. And for a lot of people, they, they, they live in a world where they lose that game and they're not and they come see me. A problem with winning the game is now you're living a life of competition. Because if, you're, if you have to be worth something, well, worth vis-a-vis -vis what? This is, again, kind of getting back to what I was addressing uh, with your question before, is that with self-esteem, if, if you're valuable, well, you have to have some sort of hierarchy to measure how valuable you are. You're not, you're not measuring your self-worth vis-a-vis squirrels or hippopotamus, you're just other people, you know, like, that's who you're judging yourself against. And that becomes a competition. How close can you get to people that you're, in, that you're working with if they're your competition? And this, 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 is, a, this is a fundamental problem in the work, in the work field. If you're worried people are going to take your ideas, you're going to be worried that you can't trust your coworkers. They're against you. Now you might not be that paranoid, and that might be overstating the case, you know, a little bit, but it's not hard to follow in that one. It, it ultimately makes it almost virtually impossible to have real vulnerable relationships with people because the moment you're vulnerable, it's admitting you're not having self-worth, you know, with that sort of I'm valuable. Being vulnerable is scary, being vulnerable is painful, and well, why the heck would you ever want to do that? You have to have self-worth. They'll know you're weak. You know, it kind of becomes this sort of thing, so you live your life alone. It's another outcome of self-esteem. Generally isolates you from the world. It also really makes it very difficult to accurately be able to know how you're doing in life. You know, there's, there's two different, bi uh, two different you know, psychological effects that come out of self-esteem. You know, one is the self-enhancement bias, where you think you're really, really good. Um, you know, everything you do is, you know, vis-a-vis -vis yourself, you know you're just fine. And again, that blind spot comes in, because everybody has, again, this is the second step of Vodas Hashem, everyone has weaknesses. So you, come, you become blind to those. But, but even worse is that you have the better than average effect. Where you're, you are, you know, in your field, I, I get a kick out of this one. Most therapists believe they're better than average. It's like 80% of therapists believe they're, they're, they're above average therapists. That defies statistics. You can't, it can't be 80% of people are, 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 are above average. And we all think this. Even people who, you know, drivers, most people, most people think they're excellent drivers. Even people who just, they themselves cause an accident. They're going to be insanely more, they know they caused the accident, and they're going to be insanely more likely to think, you know, if they have high self-esteem, they're going to be thinking, yeah, I'm an above average driver. Okay, so, you know, I, 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 not, I, I ran into the house a couple times, oops, you know, when I, my, uh, my hometown. Yeah, is that a, I'm stumbling into a personal story. We had in my hometown this, uh, there was this T intersection. You, you know, yeah, they have roundabouts here in Israel. You know, in America, like, I... I've never seen a roundabout in, in, in America. Have you guys? Yeah. In America? In there now? In Canada. So like they had they had this poor this this poor family. They they um they their house was right at the end of this T intersection. And it was only every four years somebody literally passed the stop sign running right into their house. It happened like five times. So salute so, first time it happened, it's a fluke. Second time it happened, okay, you know, like, I hope this doesn't happen again. The third time they put a huge rock 
right between their house and the street. Well, they still hit the thing. So this, by the fifth time, the city actually put the money in to create this huge, insane roundabout. You know, they, they built it up with like prairie grass and the whole thing. Like it's a, it's a, it's a citadel. This, this, uh, this roundabout. You can't, you can't miss it in the, by a mile. Okay, now they're not getting hit by cars anymore. But I bet you every one of those drivers thought that he was an above average driver. So that's another outcome of having high self-esteem. You mistakenly think you're above average. It's a good thing to know that you're not, you know? So yeah, well, you, can, you can fix it. And what they've noticed over, you know, with especially in the school systems, you know, the, the school system made a dramatic shift in how they educate kids because of all this research in the, in the 80s and early 90s about self-esteem. You know, teachers, as a, as a rule, were told not to criticize students. You know, the, that one of the most important things you get when you're actually in school is the note at the end of your assignment. And, you know, it used to be, I mean, my dad showed me, you know, the, and I don't know why he kept his old papers, you know, he's a little bit of a hoarder, I guess, but, you know, they, they, they wrote like journals, you know, on, on the writing assignment and really critiqued, you know, the work that you did and they, you know, the teachers obviously cared. You don't have, comparatively speaking, you know, Teachers are worried about losing their job because maybe it'll hurt your feelings. What ends up happening is you can't discriminate between a good job and a bad job. You never end up learning anything. That's the great inflation. You know, it used to be in the 40s, I think, you know, the, it was 80, 18, 18% of uh, kids would get an A. Today it's like 50. And it's not because people are smarter. They're not. You know, I, IQ, IQ results are the, the, the way they were in the 40s. It's because of this idea, this hesitation of, of, of breaking a person's self-esteem. And what ended up coming out of all of this is just as the, the rates of self-esteem were increasing, the rates of narcissism also started to increase. The same rate. As far as narcissism goes, that's a problem you don't want, first of all. You know, it's, it's difficult to treat psychologically. And the fact that that's actually growing is a, is, a, is a big public health concern for two reasons. One, these people can't have relationships with, with other human beings. They're just, it's not that they're sensitive, and there's this like misconception that a narcissist actually knows deep down inside that he's not good. That's not true. They know they're good. They know they're better than you and they think you're an idiot. That's, that's, that's the, uh, the layman's definition of a narcissist. They had this really fun study. What they were doing is they, they uh, to kind of to, to show you know kind of the results of, of narcissistic characteristics that people can develop, you, you end up becoming a monster at the end of the day. Like the anger that you feel when when someone knocks you down because you know it's not right. As a narcissist, you know it's not right because you know you you have that self worth and you know that you're you know approaching to perfect. Anyone that has the audacity to question that, you're going to give it to them, and they certainly do. They, they had, they, they, uh, this, this study has been reproduced a number of times, where what they showed was people who had very high self-esteem, you know, they kind of ranked everybody, you know, the high, high self-esteem index over here, and low self-esteem, okay, fine, they oriented everybody. And they had everyone run through a, it wasn't exactly an IQ test, but it was more or less along those lines. Now, because these are social scientists, they're going to, they're, they're, they have a sinister streak in them, and the, the, the trick in the research was they told everybody they had an average score to see how they'd respond. So people who had lower self-esteem, but act, in later research that had high self-compassion, they were okay with it. It's like, oh, okay, good to know. It, it, didn't, it didn't rock their world, it didn't devastate them, it didn't, it didn't send them into depression or, or into a rage. They were cool with it. They were resilient to a life challenge. People with high self-esteem just lost it. You know, in a, in a lot of the cases, it was not uncommon for these people to, you know, start, you know, name calling everybody else. Are you kidding me? You know, I, I saw those people in the waiting room. I know they're a bunch of idiots. Yeah, go ahead. How do you have, like, low self-esteem but high in the direction of how, what you were bringing up, this, this acceptance of, okay, yeah, yeah, we all make mistakes, it's okay. It's like, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe I ain't perfect, but you know what, I, I'll still take it. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a, a nice... 
<laughs> I know, right? <laughs> That's why this one can get out of control, huh? <laughs> no one does. <laughs> so that's self-esteem in a nutshell. Psych uh, psych psychologists realize they made a mistake. They spent past 10 years trying to correct the mistake and society's still trying to catch up. It takes a long time for social systems to, to respond to research. So we're all, we're all enjoying the benefits of, of narcissism and narcissistic characteristics. And that'll hopefully pan itself out. Option number two is self is self compassion. And self compassion is complex, and it seems it has three different components to it. Number one, self compassion is is having kindness towards yourself, not being self critical. Having self-judgment. It's the, it's the tendency that when you screw up, you don't call yourself a moron. That one was hard. A lot of people kind of feel like, well, aren't you, aren't you giving yourself excuses? You know, that's usually the kickback with this one. Well, be kind to yourself. Yeah, well, if I'm, if I'm easy on myself, well, you know, I'm, well I, how can I be a great human being if I'm easy on myself? That's the argument you usually hear. Like, how can you say, like, yeah, I have to work on myself, and you're just going to be like, oh, no one's perfect, so we don't really have to work on that, like, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's very accurate. What are you saying? I missed the... Like, if you, if you just justify everything that you need to improve in yourself... It's a dangerous word, justify, yeah. Then you're going to not work on yourself in any way, because any time... You like notice a flaw in yourself, you're gonna be like, oh, it's okay, I gotta go into so Yeah, that, that's, that's the misconception. It doesn't end up that way. I swear to you, it doesn't end up that way. What, because what, what ends up happening is that as, as soon as you're willing to be kind to yourself, it's a paradox. I, I hear, I hear that it's intuitively doesn't make sense what the, but. Don't you have to like first be like, okay, I'll work on that, and then be like, but it's okay? You'll never really wanna work on it because it'll just hurt too darn much every time you have to confront it. You're more likely to ignore it and have these, these biases of the above average biases. You you'll, you'll never actually realize you need to, chances are. Because you'll, again, you'll be the above average driver. You'll be the, you'll be the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the above average, you know, uh, whatever, you know, like it, you, you fall into that trap, you can't even see it. Yeah, it makes it okay to, to not be okay. Well, with self-esteem, it's like, yeah, that one, yeah. To grow, okay, so, so, so step, step, step one is, at least you can see you need to grow. That's step one. But you don't, because you're like, there's no need to grow because like, I'm, everyone's not good. So. You, th you think of all the people in your life who've ever affected you. It was never the gym teacher. You know what I mean by that? What if it was? <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. What if one? Then you got me, you're right. No. But, but you know what I mean. It's like, you know, you know, lazy bums. You know, he's the one yelling at everybody. But, you know, think, of, think in your life, the people that actually made a difference in your life, that, set you, that, that made you feel like you were worth something, they were pretty forgiven of you. They were willing to tolerate. Giving is different than like giving constructive criticism. Maybe they didn't know. Like, I have plenty of coaches who I learned a lot from. Oh, I, yeah. I, I love constructive criticism. Just the key word there is it's got to be constructive. Or even non-constructive criticism. Like you can learn from it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's not like no one really wants to know that they're not perfect. No one wants to know that they're not perfect. But like as soon as you accept it, then you're right. Someone tells you that like you're. So annoying, like you're so not perfect, and that's like kind of no, that's very general. If they say, right, like, a yes, specific but thing. like, they're, they're, they're <laughs> that's not a good way to criticize someone, right? You yeah. constructive criticism, but like, no, but I mean, you say, like, you say it in a nicer way, yeah. like, no, if you say, like, like, you don't work on it, yeah, you say, like, you're only so loud, and like, you never let anyone speak, like, okay, that wasn't meant to be constructive, but you could take that in and be like, oh, I'm gonna work on that, yes. 
You have to be a strong person to want to work on that if you keep getting hit with that over and over and over and over. And if that's the inner voice you have, if that inner voice is a self-critical voice, that, that direct, is predictive of depression. That's predictive of not wanting to get out of bed. Now, it's not everyone falls into major depression. That for sure not. But it's basically your options are, I'm a loser, I'm depressed, or, yeah, you, you ignore it. And you, you, you live in this, this above average bias. Yeah, that's a really huge jump. It's a very huge jump. Yeah. I don't know if that's so fair to say. <coughs> everyone lives with doubts. It doesn't mean they're mm -hmm. depressed. It just means that they're humans. You're more, the, the point, you're more likely to go in that direction statistically. The other is, is a sense of a common humanity. A sense that we're in this together. As opposed to, you know, as opposed to being, you know, you're on your own sort of mentality. Well, like, no one feels that way. So. Hmm? No one feels that way. No one feels like they're on their own? No, I'm saying no one feels like they're all in this together. Yeah, it's a hard one. Like you're not, like everyone's going through their own thing, like you're not in this one together. It's a, and it's a bigger problem in the West. I mean, what's, what's, what's cool about Israel is, because you, you have different, you, you, I hopefully you can appreciate the lack of lines in this country a little bit more, but it, Israel is sort of like this, this, um, uh, this mix of, of Western individualism and and sort of traditional collectivism. Countries that are collective-based, like China, you know, Asia, definitely. Um, it's the exact opposite. They have a hard time. They have a harder time being in touch with they themselves an individual, like who they who they are is actually who they're with. You see this in the Olympics when you when you watch all the Olympic champions going up to receive their medals, they get the interview afterwards, right? So you know the guy is a Westerner when he, when he's saying you know how hard he worked and he put in the hours since he was 10 years old running track. He goes on and on and on about himself as a guy who comes from a from a uh, a, an individualistic society. All the guys from Asia and also the Israelis. My coach helped me. My parents helped me. My wife was with me. You know, the fact that my, you know, my, my kids were supportive, they, they, they credit everyone else except themselves. So it's, it's a different culture. But what's kind of cool to see, uh, what kind of, they so don't have a sense of identity. That's one reason why there's no such thing as lines in China. Everyone just kind of like pushes to the front. Same thing in Israel. You know, everyone just like push, there's no such thing. The reason why is because they have a, a, a less emphasized sense of, of individual identity. It's more of a collective. We're buddies. We're together. We're a family. We're a nation. I feel like they do the opposite. Yeah. Like, every man for himself. <laughs> they just push. Well, because they don't mind pushing. Because it's like whatever. Like you know, we're all. It's like it's a it's it's a it's. It has a, with 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 the with. The, with it, 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 I mean, I'm not saying it's polite, but from a Westerner standpoint, from a Westerner standpoint, it's how could you took my space? And from a, from an Eastern standpoint, well, no one has a space. We're all sharing the space. So you're, it's not polite, but it's a different way of looking. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, it is. It's, 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 I know. It's, it's almost like it's, it's almost like a hug, you know. But a lot of people don't think it's comfortable. It's a cultural difference. Very big cultural difference. But it's but again, it's this this sense of we're all in it together is because as soon as soon as you admit that, well, you know, we all have what to work on. We all have what to work on. It's no longer a competition. It's no longer this hierarchy where you have to judge where you are and make sure you're on top. We have what to work on. Everybody, my, I, I love this. You know, my wife has all my kids. It's a chant in my home. You know, when when someone does something wrong, whatever. You know, so you gotta like you know discipline kids. And, but you know, the one one major component, my wife always makes sure that the kids say is, you know, we all make mistakes. So they have a little chant. It's cute. These you know, two year olds, four year olds. They like, we all make mistakes. Yeah, we do. And that is this is developing that we're in it together. It kind of, again, it kind of ch chisels away at this, well, you know, won't I, won't I just be lazy? Well, no, because you're a part of something bigger than you. You're a part of a group. You're part of a nation. You're a part of a family. It's like you end up not wanting to let other people down. But it's like, but you're not letting them down because, well, this is like, it's a, it's a common shared challenge that we all face. You know, it's, it's, so it's self-encouraging. We all kind of encourage ourselves when we allow ourselves to be with other people. What did you see as a problem for group? 
Like, people are just not perfect. Neither for what? Like, you won't go and be an active, like, change in society. Because you're like, there's no point. Like, like, there's no need to change. It's fine for all purposes. Not like, for all. Little bit of stuff. Again, it's a fair thing to, to think. It, it does happen to be a paradox in, in this case as well. Just like you're more willing to be, you're more, more resilient, more willing to face your own failures because you're self-forgiving. It ends up that you're self-forgiving of society, but not in the sense of you let people off. It, it, it allows a person to be able to make value judgments and follow through with them. They're willing to invest in something that's worth investing. That's, that's a, I think, a better way of putting it. And, well, and if, if society is just garbage, well, like, why invest in that? But if you have this sense of we're all in it together and you know we all we all make mistakes, well that's something to invest in. It's a challenge we're all facing. It's it, it becomes easier to relate to other people's failings because well I make failings too and well I tolerate myself, you know, might as well tolerate him. You know, it's like it, it, it becomes this this sort of you, you're more easily able to identify with, with people that way. Because you don't have to compete with them. They're not a they're not a challenge to you. you. Might as well help them. People are innately loving to one another. It's like it's it's another thing with these sorts of these sorts of questions is, you know, again, like it's it's paradoxical unless you kind of take in the human biology into account. We actually like being nice to people. We really do. You know, we're built to be with people. I mean, some of the early studies, if if you read um, John Bowlby's work, he was a uh, 50 years ago, he was a he was a British researcher. You know, he discovered that, you know, if you don't hug kids, they die. What? That's true. They die. Yeah, they, they, they die. You can feed them, you can give them formula, you give them food. If you deny them love, they die. They did that study with monkeys. Yeah, and so you, you, see, you see this in, 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 in Rome, in, well, they do. They but sure, they, you need love, and we all know that. Right, Yes, they literally. Yes, like, I'm not being extreme. Like that's what happens. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I mean, like, love is a behavior. I mean, like, you have to. You know, you can't. You can't. You can't say to a kid, "I love you" at that age. You have to pick them up. You know, you gotta like give them kisses. Like we need it. Like we're built. We're we're built to be together. You know that, and that's and that's the point. I guess I'm trying to make is like you know. When you when you, when you when you buy into the self esteem thing where you have to be better, you know it. You, you, it's hard not, again, this is in the research, it's hard not to develop, um, it's hard not to be suspicious of other people because they're all, they're all after you that you have to defend against. It makes it harder to love people. But even there, yes, people still do it. Like, we're built to love, we're built to be together. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a grace of God that we can sit in this room and not freak out. You know, I mean, a lot of animal species just can't do that. They just can't. It, crocodiles, they just freak out. I mean, like, it's, we take, but we take it for granted, you know? It's like, well, of course we're fine. Well, hold on a second. Maybe, maybe think about that one for a second. It's like, you're fine sitting next to each other. You're not crawling out of your own skin and feel threatened. We love being with other people. And if we don't, it, it, it is to our detriment. It hurts us psychologically when we're not. The last, the last point, the last quality of self-compassion is that it allows a person to be real with themselves in the moment as opposed to over identifying with their problems because again with self-esteem you're you're just you know it's a it's a it's a, a lot of suspicion a lot of uh, I'm trying to think of the term um, not suspicion but uh, you know everyone's out to get you have a sort of feel to it Paranoia, thank you, exactly. You have this paranoia, you do. You're more likely to suffer from paranoia with self-esteem. It's because you over-identify with the problems that are in your life. So you get sucked in the past, you get sucked into the future, but you don't actually have the opportunity to be in the moment. And that's, that's robbing yourself of your life, not being in the moment. A lot's going for you. And so by by being able to, to, to resist that urge of that, that 
self-critical, that I'm, I'm, I'm alone, I'm isolated, and all I have is my problems, and I better cover my back because they're out to get me, that paranoia. That's the third quality of self-compassion. You just don't have that. So how do you develop self-compassion? I hope I've I hope I, I hope I, I, I hope I haven't beaten a dead horse. I hope I made a strong case for it. it. Feels awkward, you know. It's not something that people generally, you know, buy into so easily because the society hasn't really organized itself that way. But as far as developing self-compassion, you know, there's two there's two important ways of doing that. First of all, I think I included. I have a website on the on the handout. You can actually take a, a self-compassion assessment of outlining these these. Uh, these three qualities I, I outlined for you to see where you're holding, in case you're interested. But uh, uh, once you kind of have that one down, it's you know one you have to develop a, a you have to de develop an ear for when you're being self-critical, when you have that self-judgment. You sound different in your head when you're doing it. You know a lot of my a lot of my. Uh, a lot of the clients I see who suffer from OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, usually the, the usually the fundamental problem actually is around self-esteem. It's it's that overcritical, that overbearing. Uh, uh, you better watch out. You're not good enough. You know, really running themselves into the ground, and they know it. They can tell. They can tell just the way that voice in their head sounds has that cut to it. So it's, it's worthwhile just kind of. Paying attention, how do you talk to yourself? Notice the words you use. You know, when you when you feel bad about you know not exactly measuring up. How do you sound in your head when you're beating yourself up? And pay attention to it. It's like, okay, that's that's that voice. That's the self-critical voice. And you can start building up a defense for it. Know what's there is step one. And you can kind of push back a little bit. So thank you know. Thank you very much, Mr. Self-Critical. You know, nice idea. You know, you can. You don't have to fight it necessarily. That's that's kind of almost like the. Uh, that's 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 one tragedy of it is that we all don't really need so much encouragement to actually change our lives. At the end of the day, it doesn't take so much. I mean, that it breaks my heart in the work that I do is like you have people coming in and you know, like the love they received is nothing. You know, and as soon as you show a little bit of caring to these people, it's like their life dramatically changes. It doesn't take a lot to transform your life. Just be a little nicer to yourself. But you gotta catch when you're not. That's one tactic to improve self-compassion. The other side, the other is, is keeping a journal. Writing yourself love notes. You know, when you when you face a challenge in life, something comes up. You know, and, you know, you, you might not be able to catch that critical voice. You might beat yourself up. Okay, it's a hard one to get over. But if you actually invest the time, take ten minutes, and pra it's almost like a type of uh, a training ground, a practice. You know, write yourself a love note. You know, you know, I know that was really hard. You know that that uh, you lost your temper at the at the waiter at the restaurant today. You know, you were. I know. You know, you feel bad about it. You were having a hard day. You had a fight with your with your mom or your dad, whatever it was. You know, we've all been there. Write yourself a love note. You're investing in yourself when you do it. You automatically are telling yourself you're someone who should be held to a higher standard, not because you need to be beaten up to do it, because you're actually worth holding yourself up to that standard. Well, those those two those two skills can get you can get you far in developing this sense of self compassion. It's the first step of Vodas Hashem. Love yourself because you're worth loving. Any questions, thoughts? As far as my end, that does it for me. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah.